Good morning. I guess nobody realized that I stopped playing. <laughs> I did. When I stop playing, that means sit down, please. <laughs> All right. Good morning. Welcome to the First United Methodist Church of Heath. My name is Carla Brooks, and I'm the chair of the board here at the church. So the first thing I want you to do is you all have a bulletin, right? Everybody got one. Everybody got a bulletin? This is the first time we've probably had a bulletin in two years. The first thing I want you to do is turn to the music ministry page. See that QR code? We need help in the different aspects of, of getting this Sunday's morning service on. We need volunteers to do just what I'm doing right now, making announcements. We need volunteers to run the Facebook page. 
Kim will show you what to do. Volunteers all throughout this service to do the many different things to keep this service going. So, if you would please, if you don't know how to use the QR code, Kim will gladly show you at your convenience. And please volunteer for the different areas that we need help with on a Sunday morning. It's not that hard. Okay, so the other announcements are blood drive. Blood drive is Tuesday, February 22nd. I think Kim said we only have six people signed up. So please sign up for this blood drive. Um, in these times of uh, need, we always need blood. Also, for those of you who love crawfish and shrimp, the car crawfish cartel will be again in our parking lot starting next weekend. I think it's usually Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. They're not here every weekend because they do do, um, you know, they do cater different events, but they will be here and uh, we might even think about doing, Neil, a little um, event around the crawfish cartel like we did last year. Also, um, family Sunday school style is every Sunday morning at 9.15 in the Fellowship Hall. And I think that's about it. Well, Kim would say, okay, choir is getting ready to do the Easter cantata. Please, please, please come join us. Uh, we can always use your beautiful voices uh, in, our, in our choir. Uh, and I believe that's it. And Kim, you didn't tell me who I'm supposed to pass this baton off to. <laughs> If you would please stand, we're going to proclaim our belief in Christ by reciting the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended to death. The third day he rose from the dead. He descended to heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of life, and the life everlasting.
again. Sorry, I, I did that. Good morning. How are you? Oh, we got one other brave soldier coming up. I like it. <laughs> All right, so today I have something here. I have some dominoes. And uh, hey, Lucas, come on up. All right, so I have a question. So let's say this domino is you, right? And in the Bible, do you know how it talks about how we are supposed to share the love of Jesus with everybody around us and tell them about who Jesus is. 
right? It tells us that in the Bible. It says to go therefore and make disciples of all nations, right? Meaning go and tell people about Jesus so that they can know who he is and love him too. So if it's talking about going and telling people of all nations, so you, all nations, there's a kid like somewhere all the way far away from you that needs to hear about him, right? Doing this on carpet should be interesting, <laughs> right? <laughs> so <clears throat> I have a question. How do you get all the way over there to tell that person about Jesus? Walking, walking that's very true. <laughs> but you know what? It's, it's kind of far to walk. It's hard to walk that far, right? And so what you do is maybe you tell this person who's close to you, right? Who's right there. And then maybe that person tells another person that they're close to, right? And then they tell another person. And then they tell a person. And so on. Put that down for a second. See if I can go a little faster. Maybe I put my person a little too far away. Sorry, I apologize. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and pray. Bow your heads and repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for loving us. Help us to share your love with everyone around us. Amen.
All right, is this microphone working? Can we hear? Audrey, you were the one keeping me honest last week. Feel free to do so again. She is a troublemaker, but I am a fast talker, so she'll, she'll keep me honest. I appreciate that. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I am glad to be back with you this week. Now, I said last week that if you saw me repeatedly, it would mean something happened in scheduling preachers. That is not the case this week. I had my good friend Sam scheduled to preach, and I called him off because I said I wanted to be back this week to be with you two weeks in a row at least. See how folks are doing. See, see how we're responding. So I'm glad to be here with you again. We're at an interesting time here in the congregation of First UMC Heath. And I want you all to just take a moment to breathe. Listen for the Spirit of God in this place amongst us, in all of us. It is the very life that we need, the inspiration we need to make it through any given week, but certainly to make it through the place, the phase, the stage that we are in now, a stage of renewal and regeneration. Will you stand with me for the reading of the gospel? Our gospel reading comes from the gospel according to St. John chapter 2. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother, his brothers, and his disciples, and they remained there for a few days. The word of God for the people of God. You may be seated. Well, if you were here last week, you know that I start every sermon with a confession. Today, my confession is that I am often extremely judgmental, critical, and dismissive of other people's artistic endeavors. If I don't really like a piece of art, it is probably the case that I really don't like a piece of art. Or if my kids have discovered a new popular song, if it can really be called that, I can be closed off, unfair, and ungracious. So I have to remind myself often that I am an audience, but I am not the audience. This confession bubbled to the surface while writing the sermon because for centuries biblical scholars believed that John's gospel was the most anti-Semitic of all the gospels in the New Testament. There are several reasons for this. John's gospel is the most overt 
in making references to Jewish, Jewish customs that Jesus challenges. This may seem to many of us who read this story today that when Jesus challenges a Jewish custom, it means that Christianity has superseded Judaism, has replaced it, has surpassed it, and nullified it. It was only relatively recently in the past couple of centuries when Christian scholars began to engage Jewish scholars about how the New Testament was written. And they found that it was not the most anti-Semitic of the Gospels, but the most Jewish of the Gospels. Now that may seem weird, but it makes sense when you think that John was writing to the first community of Jesus' followers, many of whom had been Jewish. So many of the customs, many of the rituals, many of the references that Jesus seems to supersede would have been well-known, understood, and sacred to the Jews in that first audience. Jesus was elevating what he was teaching. The author of John was elevating what Jesus was doing to that immediate level of sacredness by including these customs that folks already held sacred. So the blatant references to Judaism in John are not put downs. John wasn't highlighting Jewish traditions to put them down. John was highlighting them because they were integral and important to the identity of his audience. It could be used to help describe what was new in God's revelation in Jesus. So let's dig in a little bit here. I perform a lot of weddings. I have done so for many years. I was a youth minister for like a decade, which means... All these people come out of the woodwork who want me to do their wedding because at some point they decided to quit going to church and doing that for themselves, right? They didn't meet a new pastor, so they have to go back to their youth minister. So when I perform and attend many of these weddings as I do, I make observations about things that are unique to weddings. First, the depth of detail to which a family will go to plan and prepare for a wedding makes most other things in life look totally haphazard. There are, of course, the big things like flowers and gowns and buffets, but even down to little things like having the perfect hashtag for everyone's social media accounts, creating signature cocktails to connect to each of, to each of the bride and groom's personalities, and birdseed or bubbles or sparklers or wildflowers or non-toxic biodegradable confetti to toss into the air as they leave for the elaborate party. So much planning goes into creating the perfect wedding because it's an extremely important celebration. People are very critical at weddings too. I find myself in this boat. The food, the flowers, the dresses, so imagine the shame of having not prepared enough and running out of wine when the party is at full swing. Weddings are an interesting mix of the sacred and the secular. We love our weddings to have wonderful sacred Christian ritual in the sanctuary or the chapel, and we pray and invoke the names of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But a lot of times when we get back to the reception hall, it's time to get down, right? And it's not hymns that we're dancing to, it's Beyonce and Kanye, and somehow still the village people and Cool and the gang are in the mix. I'm not sure how they've survived this long. Weddings are strange events. But they are important celebrations wherein we offer and receive hospitality, where we think and speak a lot about love and devotion and covenant, and where we overtly recognize transformation and new beginnings. And in most cases, they are joyous, wonderful celebrations. Now, this wedding story in the Gospel of John is the beginning of Jesus' ministry. It is Jesus' first miracle. And when I was first taught this story, it was grouped together with all of the miracles. 
You know, it's pretty convenient to create a curriculum and you cram them all in there. So as I was taught it, the changing of water into, into wine demonstrates that Jesus has come to do things for people that they cannot do for themselves. Right? There's a crisis at the wedding. We've run out of wine. Jesus steps in. Miracle. Problem resolved. In my early lessons, we moved pretty quickly by it, probably because our Sunday school teachers didn't want us to spend too much time talking about why wine was so essential to the celebration. We moved on to the healing of the sick, the feeding of 5,000, raising Lazarus from the dead. And so this story was not one that I referred to when I thought how incredible Jesus' ministry and miraculous deeds were were. And it was certainly not one that I thought of when I thought of how beautiful and complex the Bible is. But this story is complex and it's beautiful and it's important. So let's look a little bit at that complexity. So first let's look at the six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification. These elements would have been familiar to the Jews hearing this story. They would have already known that as part of Jewish hospitality, water is set aside for folks to cleanse themselves after long journeys or for high holy festivals and celebrations. The containers are themselves a sign of hospitality. Come in, take off your sandals, wash and cool yourself, and be welcome. This purification was not simply to ward off uncleanliness. It was also used as a sign of welcome. These traditions, these customs mentioned here in the setting of the scene of the wedding, creating the space for Jesus' miracle, are all rooted in the law. And throughout the Hebrew scriptures, what most of us call the Old Testament, we read the voice of the lawgiver. The lawgiver is the voice that tells the audience the rules tells us how to behave in case someone steals something or, God forbid, someone is killed in an accident. The lawgiver tells us who is to blame and how to make restitution. The lawgiver is most interested in maintaining order. And this is an important voice, an essential voice, because when bad things happen and people are hurt, people are emotional and irrational, well, it can lead to even worse things. Revenge, warfare, Genocide. The lawgiver wants to avoid as much internal strife as possible, and so it insists on rules and laws. Now, some of these laws have to do with purity and cleanliness, as you well know. If you've spent any time reading the Old Testament, while these seem to be more sacred religious ritual than the practical means, to some of them may seem like little more than religious ritual, but many are intended to avoid consequences. Let's take the example we have here in this wedding tale. The containers which Jesus uses to make new wine are used for maintaining ritual cleanliness of the guests, the food, the furniture, the whole ceremony and celebration would have been wiped down, made clean. And who among us doesn't think it's a good idea that we wash our hands before we eat? Right? Especially in the time of COVID. Who among us doesn't think it's a good idea to make sure the plates are clean and the food is clean and it doesn't smell spoiled? There are very practical reasons for insisting upon cleanliness, especially before refrigerators and disinfectants. The lives of one's guests might literally depend on things being kept clean. So protecting one's guests through ritual cleanliness was an important and essential act of hospitality. These water jars were an essential symbol of hospitality. And you probably also know that at the very highest level for Jews of the time, one could not enter into the temple in Jerusalem, into the presence of God, if one was unclean for any reason, whether that was physical or spiritual. These ritual acts of cleansing allowed a person to come fully into the presence of God. 
So John's deep cultural connection with his Jewish audience allowed him to tell a story wherein Jesus uses these sacred, time-honored elements and traditions, repurposes these vessels used for making one clean, for making people feel welcome. Jesus uses them to do something totally new and wonderful, something truly miraculous. For his Jewish audience, the author of the Gospel of John is suggesting that there is a new way to come into the presence of God, a new way of understanding how one is cleansed. So let's not forget the symbol of wine here in this story. It's a significant symbol for Jewish audiences. It was a symbol of the Messiah. So by John connecting Jesus to wine, it was a sign of Jesus being the Messiah. For anybody in the audience who is Greek, wine for the Greeks was a sign of divinity. Here at the beginning of his ministry, Jesus changing the water used for ritual cleansing into wine, a sign of the Messiah, would have created for new Christians a theme throughout the whole telling of Jesus' ministry. That Jesus' timing, his miracles and signs, and ultimately his death on a cross were not simply things that happened, but that they were signs of the Messiah, appointed by God for the salvation of the world. Even though we don't get the bread and wine at the Last Supper in John, like we do in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the earliest audience of the Gospel of John would have been well aware of what happened at the Last Supper and would have naturally connected the wine and Jesus' creation of the wine with the blood and the cross. Another detail I'd like to mention about John's brilliant storytelling here is the character of Jesus' mother. Jesus' mother is a character who's really driving the action, and her interaction with her son is intriguing, to say the least. Listen again. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. So woman, especially in the way that I just enunciated it, could sound a little rude. It probably really isn't, right? It's more like ma'am or madam, which sounds a little distant for Jesus talking to his mom, and maybe it is. But Jesus is about to begin his ministry that will lead to his death. There's something a little deeper here too, though. Jesus' mother, who isn't even called Mary in the Gospel of John, only appears twice. Here she's prompting Jesus to do his first sign and really start his ministry. And then she appears again at the cross when her son is dying. And Jesus refers to her again, woman, behold your son. And the disciple that Christ loves, Jesus says to him, here is your mother. Jesus' mother acts as the bookend character for Jesus' ministry. And I think that makes, a beautiful, that makes beautiful sense, as she was the first to know that the Savior was coming into the world. Mary was the first to feel the exhilaration, the pride, to cherish both that she would have a child, but also that he would be anointed by God. All the fears and hopes and dreams that come with simply becoming a parent, but with so much more overlaid knowing that her son would be the savior of the world. As the body of Christ in the 21st century, we face some very peculiar challenges. Our churches, our congregations have been vessels for individual and community transformation for decades and centuries. And yet we are aging, our buildings are aging, and the deep relationships that, in, our, in my experience, only take shape in intergenerational congregations that were once prioritized by so many in our culture seem to have been deprioritized by entire generations. 
And so we, an audience of God's continual revelation, must reimagine how we will allow Christ to work new miracles in the vessels of our bodies, in the vessels of our church buildings. Like John's original audience, we too are engaged in that tension between keeping ourselves safe, maintaining our values and our traditions, our preferences, and keeping order while we also seek to welcome in new people who will bring with them new thoughts, new beliefs, new traditions, new needs, new hopes, and new aspirations. We believe so deeply in the transformative power of Jesus, it's sometimes hard to know what to do with someone who has their doubts about Jesus or doesn't like the church at all or has found comfort and clarity and identity with another faith or comfort in a faith of their own invention. How do we invite them into our space? How do we sit and share what is so dear and clear to us and listen and hear what is so clear and dear to them? What do we lose of ourselves, our identity, our assuredness, if we acknowledge that someone can hate something that we love or believe something that we could never believe? It is certainly a major tension, not just in the church, but in our nation. A couple of final points before I end here. We shouldn't live in fear that we will lose ourselves by inviting others. In the Father's house, there are many rooms we've been taught. Those six vessels for the ritual, each 20 to 30 gallons, that's between 600 and 900 bottles of wine. That is an absurd amount of wine for Jesus to make when the wedding is already in full swing. It is a sign of God's abundance. Jesus' miracle isn't just enough for those who have been invited to the celebration. There's enough for everyone. My final point, Jesus' miracle is not observed by the most esteemed guests, by the revelers, even the bridegroom and the bride. It's witnessed, made possible, participated in by the servants. From the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, he includes the lower rungs of society, demonstrating again that Jesus is not simply the Messiah for a chosen few. The author of John teaches us with this complex and beautiful story that Jesus is the Messiah of the whole world. To you, brothers and sisters in Christ, let us heed Jesus' mother's words. Do whatever he tells you. For I am certain that our hour for proclaiming the good news has indeed come. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Neil. prepared us for a meal, a party, and you're all invited. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. 
It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people here on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us, us from slavery and to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks, gave it to his, he broke the bread and gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your spirit on us. Gather it here. And on these gifts of bread and wine, make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your son, Jesus Christ, and with his Holy Spirit and his holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Would you join me in what we've come to know as the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. <coughs> Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Bread turned into the body of Christ. We don't have wine here this morning. We've got more. We've got something better. We've got the blood of Jesus Christ. You don't have to be a Methodist. You don't have to be a member of this church. You need to be somebody who wants to know, wants to know God as your personal Savior through His Son, Jesus Christ. Come, the table is set. The food is prepared through the Son God Almighty. Again, this morning we'll be serving these individual servings. And some of you may have not had these yet. Some of you have had them and struggled. And I want to give you instructions. I've asked to do this again. This little tab, instead of peeling it up, bend it down. 
until it breaks. And then you can peel it up much easier. But before you do all that, there's another little tiny piece of cellophane that you pull open to get the bread. And then you pull the rest of it open for the juice. This is not wine. As a little boy in my congregation once always stated, blood of Jesus. Are we going to have the blood of Jesus today? Come and receive. The table is set. Will you accept the invitation to receive what God has offered you by offering his son in yours and my place that we may live forever? Come and receive. By the way, I've handed these out before, but I want you to take because God said come and take. Take the bread and take the juice. Fed by the table, inspired by God's Spirit, now we are charged to go out into the world, witnesses to God's abundance. 
witnesses to new life that God has given us, that we are now called to go and share and testify to, to all that we meet, to the entire world. Go now in peace. In the name of Jesus, Jesus' Father, and God's Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.